Good afternoon and welcome to our this uh, special webinar that we're doing on um, the ISO's new guidance on international transfers. As I say, we, we mentioned when we did the uh, last update uh, a few weeks ago um, that we were expecting the ICO to publish its guidance on transfer risk assessments very shortly. I, I can't remember we said we thought that might be in November, um, but it turned out that it was just seven days later that the ICO did indeed finally um, publish this guidance. Um, and that was um, put on the ICO's website with a blog post from the ICO's Director of Legal Services explaining the approach, and we'll talk a bit about that as we as we go through it. So what we're going to do today um, is say this is a, an extra webinar we put on because we know this is an area of um, great interest to to you all. Is summarise what what the ICO has published, um, and I suppose set out our initial reflections on that in terms of where where we're seeing the guidance be helpful, where there are areas that are still uncertain, where there are areas of challenge that, that remain and, and how we see this panning out. Um, as, you, as we get into detail, you'll see that there are some potentially quite complex areas um, to navigate. And that's particularly so if you are subject to both UK and, and EU law, or you're, for example, processing for an only UK control. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we as we go through. So the, the order of events today, um, Grant is going to kick off um, with an overview of the new guidance and talk about the key changes from the drafts that were published uh, back at the start of this year. Rachel will then take you through the questions in the uh, ICO's new TRA tool that's published alongside the guidance. And then I'll finish up with some closing reflections on the new approach, where we're seeing areas of divergence emerge between the UK um, and the EU and some of the practical issues to consider and we will then have some time at the end for for questions to so do please do pop them in the the q a um as we go along and we'll pick them up at the end so on that um, i hand over to grant who will start off with the the overview and introduction thank you martin good afternoon everyone yeah so i'm going to just give an overview of the guidance on international transfers and transfer risk assessments that was published this month by the ico um probably worth though just taking a step back and just looking at the timelines for all of this. So we had the SHREMS 2 judgment in July 2020. Then a few months later, the EDPB published its first uh, post-SHREMS 2 recommendations and further guidance was issued by the EDPB and finalised over the next kind of 12 months or so from that date. Uh, in June of 21, the EU Commission uh, issued new standard contractual clauses. And then Back in August 2021, the IC opened a consultation on international transfers, the International Data Transfer Agreement and transfer risk assessments. In February this year, the IC will publish its IDTA and addendum, which came into force in March. But we've been waiting for guidance to accompany those documents. And it was in November this year, uh, this month, that the ICO finally published some guidance, not all guidance, but some guidance, and that's that that we're going to talk to. So, in terms of the guidance, the three components, um, an updated guidance on international transfers, uh, the transfer risk assessment guidance, and it's those two things that I will talk to in the next few minutes, and then the transfer risk assessment tool, which Rachel will talk to uh, following uh, my words. I think in general terms, the ICO in the blog um, is trying to set out an alternative approach to the one that the European Data Protection Board put forward, uh, one that it considers to be achievable and balances giving the right protection for data subjects whilst also being reasonable and proportionate. And that approach is based on focusing whether the transfer concern significantly increases uh, the risk of a privacy or other human rights breach. So it's very much focused on, is this going to affect the data subjects? Are they going to be adversely affected either in terms of privacy or human rights breach? And we'll come, we'll come to talk about that when we look at the tool. Um, clause by clause guidance on the IDT, IDTA and addendum is still to come. And I think that's very much overdue and will be very, very much welcome for those of us who've used them. We do have a number of questions as to how they, we think they're meant to be used. And I've certainly been involved in a couple of negotiations where people have taken different views on how these things should be used. So we'll be very, very welcome to get the ICO's guidance when that comes. In terms of the international transfers guidance, so this is the first leg of the 
the guidance of three components. Um, I think the first thing um, to mention is that I, I find that there's some very helpful observations on international transfers in the context of some some fairly common factual scenarios, and I've I've listed those in in the next this slide and the next one. So some of them I think are ones that you would readily expect, and most of us uh, thought were correct anyway. But it is useful even for those, uh, even though they may be self-explanatory, to have them in one place uh, as authoritative ICO views, so they can be so you know we can avoid can avoid um, any kind of mix-ups with others that we're dealing with. So um, first point is um, when you're transferring data within the same legal entity, there is not a restricted transfer. Uh, the second point again, which I, th I think aligns with the EDPB as well, is where data subjects themselves are transferring the data, then that's not a restricted transfer because they're out of the scope of the GDPR, uh, but onward transfers by the recipient may be so far so straightforward. Then the third proposition, and this is one that is, I think, really interesting. So what the ICO is saying is it's only the controller or processor who initiates or agrees the transfer who is responsible for complying with the restricted transfer rules. So where a UK processor appoints a sub-processor outside the UK, it's the processor not the controller that is responsible for complying with the restricted transfer rules, even though the controller gave the processor the authority in the processing contract to appoint sub-processors. And even where the data flow is directly from the controller to the sub-processor. But what the ICO then goes on to say is though, that it expects that controllers will carry out appropriate DD checks ones that are reasonable and proportionate to the risk that the data sharing uh, poses. And that's part of the more general requirement for a controller when appointing a processor uh, to only use processors offering sufficient guarantees under Article 28. So that's the first example. Second example it gives, and again, this goes back to who is initiating or agreeing the transfer. But a controller appoints two processors, one in the UK, one overseas, and it instructs the UK processor to transfer data to the overseas one. In that case, it's the controller, not the UK processor, that needs to comply with the restricted transfer rules because it's not the processor that is initiating or agreeing the transfer because the processor, it's not a sub-processor relationship. The relationship is with the controller. The third example, which uh, again, I find really interesting is on reverse transfers. So what the, what the ICO guidance says there is if a processor sends or returns, so this is not a, the first scenario is where the controller is caught by UK GDPR. So if a processor sends or returns data to the controller of that data outside the UK, then that is not a restricted transfer because it's the controller that's initiating the transfer and transfer back. So if the data is coming from the controller to the process and back to the controller, it is effectively treated as being a single entity transfer. So it's controller to controller via the processor. But then the, going further, so in that scenario where, where the controller is not subject to UK GDPR, then the transfer to the processor and then back to the controller isn't a restricted transfer. But actually, the ICO guidance goes further and says that if the, if the processor then transfers the data to an other entity, so not back, just back to the controller, that itself is also not a restricted transfer because it is initiated by the controller and it's outside the, the scope of UK GDPR. So if the controller instructs, controller is not subject to UK GDPR, instructs a UK processor to transfer data to a third party, that is not a restricted transfer either. However, where the processor initiates the transfer, i.e. probably um, appoints a sub-processor and transfers data to it, that would be subject to UK GDPR. So it's quite interesting, the various scenarios that come out of the the idea that it is who is initiating or agreeing the transfer. And I think there's 
scope, and I think Martin will touch on this in relation to his reflections, I think there is scope there to plan um, around, around that test as to who's going to be responsible for the particular restricted transfer, particularly for controllers. The other thing that the guidance does, and I don't have time to cover it in this session, but the guidance talks through the various Article 46 safeguards and the various exemptions under Article 49 and contains very useful guidance as to when these can be deployed and if they are deployed, um, what scenarios you need or what factors you need to think about when considering them. So I want to talk now uh, a bit about the transfer risk assessment guidance. As I say, Rachel's going to talk about the tool itself, but there are some useful general observations in there that I think are worth recounting. So we will talk a lot about you know, the standard contractual clauses, the IDTA and addendum, but the guidance makes it clear that transfer risk assessments must be used with all Article 46 safeguard measures, not just the IDTA and addendum. Focus is on two main risk types. So access to the data in the destination country by governments and other surveillance agencies who may access that data and are not bound by the Article 46 mechanism that's been chosen. It also focuses on the risks that are posed by an inability to actually enforce the Article 46 mechanism in the destination country. So the guidance talks about two options. Um, the first option, which is the ICO's approach in the TRA tool, is to look at risk from a privacy and human rights perspective. If the transfer went ahead, are there significant additional risks to the privacy rights or the human rights of the individual, individual data subjects whose data has been transferred? So that's option one. Option two is a comparison of the laws and practices of the recipient country, the destination country, against those of the UK. And are those safeguards sufficiently similar? So look at the comparison of the laws and the practices that are relevant and actually are the safeguards that they offer uh, sufficiently similar, which the ICO says is the EDPB's approach. And what the ICO says is it considers both approaches are equally valid. So you have a choice. You can take the EDPB approach or you can take the ICO approach. And I suspect that what you might look at the EDPB approach if you are dual regulated, you may have gone through that approach for um, your EU processing operations, in which case I think the ICO is saying, well, you can look at that and, and if it's valid in the, for the EU, then it probably will work for the UK as well. Uh, organizations that are not EU regulated are more likely, I think, to look at option one. Um, the last thing that it said is where you've got a process, a continuous process of restricted transfers, then regular reviews of the protections need to be made to ensure they don't decrease over time. So this is not a one side, one, one exercise, and then you're, you're free. You need to keep diarising to revisit the assessment that you made. Um, to ensure that the protections that you put in place remain valid. So these are general observations. I'll hand over now to Rachel, who's going to talk about the transfer risk tool and how to operate it in practice. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Grant. So as um, Grant just mentioned there, there's now two options um, that the ICO um, <clears throat> offers for undertaking transfer risk assessment. So we're going to now run through the ICO TRA tool, which is recently published. Um, and as Grant mentioned, this is the option one. So there are six questions um, and I'm just going to run through um, each, each of them so you can be a bit more familiar with, with the tool um, um, if you are going to be using it um, in the near future. So question one um, asks you, what are the specific circumstances of the restricted transfer? Um, now, this is the first step essentially to map out the what, why and how around the transfer that you want to do. The tool gives you space to fill in details on the importer the destination country, the role of the importer, so that would be controller, joint controller or processor, what the importer will be doing, who the data subjects are and what personal data will be transferred. 
The section also asks you to set out the volume and duration of the transfers together with how the data will be shared practically um, and any agreed technical and organisational measures that will be implemented to protect the information when it's been transferred to the importer. Helpfully, the ICO does say that you can cross-refer to the IDTA to save you replicating any details um, should you have already covered the detail within that. So moving on to question two. What is the level of risk to people in the personal information you are transferring? So the next step is to take the profile of the circumstances around the transfer that you've prepared for question one and assign it an initial risk level. You can do this by filling in the table that you see on the slide where you consider each type of personal data that you are going to be transferring. Helpfully, um, there is an appendix to the tool which gives some indicative scoring for different types of personal data. Um, so you can refer to this to assess for each category whether there's going to be a low, moderate or high risk to the applicable data subjects. Um, so just running through what those risk profiles are, um, low risk data types, which the ICO suggests as information such as name and address, um, are those which are unlikely to cause more than inconsequential financial harm, physical harm, mental harm or distress. Moderate risk data types, um, which includes for or which could, I should say, um, cover images captured by CCTV and marital history, um, are those which are unlikely to cause more than minor financial harm, physical harm, mental harm or distress. And then moving on to your high risk data types, um, which could be most relevant in the case of biometric data, medical records or criminal convictions information. Um, are those types of information which are likely to cause significant financial harm, physical harm, mental harm or distress. There is then space within the tool to record any specific circumstances around the data that you're transferring, which may increase the initial risk level or any mitigating factors that you can apply to reduce that risk level. So you can see the, the table there and you can add as many rows um, as are applicable for your transfer, depending on how much personal data or how many personal data types that you'll be transferring. So moving on to question three, um, what is a reasonable and proportionate level of investigation given the risk level in the personal information and nature of your organisation? So this next step is undertaking an investigation on the specific risks in the proposed transfer and the slide here shows the table where you would record what kind of investigation you need to do. Essentially this takes into account the risk level that you've assigned to the personal data from step two, the size of organisation organisation that you are and the resources that you have available and the volume of data that you're transferring. So you'll see there, um, there's a, a column based on business size. So to be considered an SME, the ICO says um, that you can use the level, the tier level that you use um, to pay your data protection fee um, as an indication of whether you're an SME or not. So if you currently pay um, the tier one or tier two fee, you're likely to be an SME and then all others would fall into the large business category. And so moving on to the next slide, um, this outlines the type of investigations which you would then be expected to carry out based on, on your on the risk profile that you um, that you decided that you needed to do um, on that first slide there. Um, so it is helpful. Um, there's a lot of information here around what kind of resources um, the ICO suggests that you consult when you conduct these investigations essentially on the status or what's likely to happen to the personal data in the destination country. So it starts off with level one investigations looking at, you know, a general level, what protections are given to human rights in the destination country um, through things like looking at the SEO reports um, and anything published by Amnesty International. Um, and then level two and level three investigations progress to more in-depth research on particular protections offered um, to the human rights that might be at particular risk for your transfer. Um, and then with the highest risk transfers, likely needing specialist input from advisors in the, the destination country. So once you have carried out your investigation and you have the information about the risk level, which you may have edited um, 
during the investigation phase. Um, the next stage is to ask you um, to consider the findings of your investigation and decide whether the transfer would increase the risk of a human rights breach in the destination country for the applicable data subjects. And so either by making the, the transfer, making the human rights risk more likely to happen or making it more severe if it did happen. So if we move on to this slide here, um, I've posted a simplified um, version of the key human rights um, from the ECHR. Um, and so the ICO suggests that you, you think about these when you're thinking about the risks. Um, other key questions to ask at this stage would be around what factors can you reasonably know, imply or predict about what could happen to the personal data when it's been transferred? So, for example, do you know or is it likely that any of the people the information is about are citizens or residents of the destination country? Or is it reasonably possible that they will travel to that destination country? If so, and if you've transferred their information to that country, is there any risks to their human rights based on that transfer? So that's something to think about there. And moving on to question five. This then asks you um, whether you're satisfied that both you and the people the information is about will be able to enforce the Article 46 transfer mechanism against the importer in the UK. And also if enforcement action outside the UK is needed, are you satisfied that you and the people the information is about will be able to enforce the Article 46 transfer mechanism in the destination country? So when we say Article 46 transfer mechanism, that's your standard contractual clauses or any other mechanism that you're using to or that you're proposing to use to legitimise the transfer. So the next stage is to use the, the table provided um, to understand if there are any concerns about the treatment of personal data in the destination country. Um, so, for example, thinking about concerns about respect for the rule of law um, and also independence of courts and judges. Um, the table also asks you to think about whether the importer would accept the decision of a UK court or arbitration award. If any concerns are raised at this stage, um, the tool also helpfully has an appendix where it has suggestions of extra steps and protections that you can consider putting in place um, before the data is transferred. And then this can be fed into the overall assessment of risk, so potentially to lower the risk. So, for exam example, um, some of the measures that the, the, the tool suggests are thinking about access controls, whether you can minimise or reduce any amount of the personal information that you're going to transfer and whether there's any organisational, technical or contractual measures in addition to the contracts that you already have in place that could be implemented. So at the end of that step, um, the tool may approve the transfer, but if it doesn't, um, which would um, be in the case that you'd have to then move on to question six. So as Grant mentioned, um, sometimes you can't use one of the exceptions or derogations in Article 49 to still legitimise your transfer to a third country. So this question here asks whether if you still have some outstanding personal data that you consider um, is of significant high risk, should the transfer take place, whether any of the Article 49 derogations would apply to that. So, for example, um, you're probably familiar with this, but this would be, for example, if you have consent or um, if it's necessary um, to enter into the contract between you and the data subject. So, if you can apply one of the derogations um, and you've got any subsisting high risk or high, yeah, higher risk information, then you can continue with the transfer, but if any of the derogations don't apply, then the tool will suggest that the transfer doesn't go ahead. So I'll now pass on to Martin for some reflections. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I disappeared off there. I don't know if anyone noticed, um, but my internet connection went down, so pleased to be back on just in time. Um, so yeah, in, in this bit, I'm going to just talk about, I suppose, just reflecting on what uh, Grant and Rachel have covered um, and where we see some of the challenges, some of the themes coming through um, in relation to, to the new guidance. So I, mean, I think that the key, the key sort of takeaway for all of this is that the ICO's approach here provides a lot more choice um, 
and the ability to, to take a risk-based approach, something which wasn't available under the EDPB guidance, um, which gives gives people a lot more flexibility. As, as Grant said, you know, that there are two options here. There's option one, which is an option two, um, but you only have that choice if you are not, your transfer is not subject to EU GDPR. So if your transfer is going to be regulated by EU GDPR um, as well, um, or, or instead, then you will need to do option two um, rather than using the, the ICO's tool that the Rachel talked through there. Um, and that then means you need to follow the EDPB guidance. I'll talk a little bit about that and where, where we see some of the differences. So, so when does that arise? Well, if if you are a UK business and you've got you're established in the EU, for example, you've got a branch there or or similar that brings you within the rules and establishment. But also if you are caught by the extraterritorial rules. So if you are a controller or a processor and your the processing you're carrying out relates to goods or services being offered to individuals in the EU, um, or it relates to monitoring their behavior. And that that is potentially quite wide, as we talked about on six monthly updates. You know, we, we are seeing this come up more and more for UK organisations who are doing things with, with an EU aspect and actually understanding now that they are dual regulated. And this is one of the areas where dual regulation really causes some additional complications and uh, issues to, to work through. The other issue to bear in mind is that if you're part of a group of companies, uh, say you have UK and EU subsidiaries um, and you are using a joint, uh, jointly using a service provider or you have a parent company outside the UK and EU, then the approach you take to transfers from the UK bit of the business will be different to what you would be able to do for uh, the EU. So from a consistency point of view, you might be looking at um, you know, applying the EU approach to all transfers um, to ensure that they work rather than transferring different data depending on where, where you are. So on, on the, the EDPB guidance, so um, there are a few points I suppose just to flag in terms of where we're now seeing divergence. So one of them is around transfers back to non-EU controllers, and Grant touched a bit about the a bit on this earlier in terms of where the UK is going. So whereas the the ICO is saying that transferring data back to if you are a UK processor transferring to a non-UK controller who's not subject to UK law, then you don't need to worry about Chapter Five and the international transfer rules. The EDPB takes a different view, and it says that. Um, that transfer will be regulated, even if that um, controller is is not subject to EU GDPR. So that's one thing to, to bear in mind, but there's a, a real difference. The, the other point to flag, and this was in the Commission's guidance, again, we've sp spoken about this previously, but when the Commission published its Q&As on, on the new SCCs, they said they're not appropriate to use where the importer is itself subject to GDPR under, the, under Article 32 in terms of extraterritorial application and the commission said it's working on an additional set of standard contractual clauses for that scenario but that then leaves um, anyone who's in that boat subject uh, in a bit of limbo in terms of what they do just now because there is no valid transfer tool that they can use so again if 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 you are in that position where uh, the the importer is is potentially caught by eu gdpr and the extraterritorial rules then it, it's a bit difficult to work out, work through what you need to be doing on that. In terms of the approach to the, the assessment you need to do, I mean, the, the key thing to be aware of here is that the, in the UK, the ICO is called this transfer risk assessment. The EDPB refers to a transfer impact assessment. And that very much reflects the difference in approach that we're now seeing. So what the, the EDPB is saying is that you need to carry out an assessment of the equivalence of the laws in that destination territory to EU law. And that um, can be quite a time consuming exercise to do for anyone who's been through that process. It, it's complex and time consuming and, and, and expensive in terms of getting advice on that. Whereas if you look at what the ICO is doing, you know, look at say the option one um, approach, it's much higher level um, and the different stages of that, you know, the, the level one is very, well, fairly straightforward in, indeed. And so yeah, the, with the EDPB, what, what, what you're being asked to do is assess whether or not there is problematic legislation and whether that impacts upon the transfer tool that you're using. Now you can look at the practical application of that and say, well, it does, you know, say Pfizer 702 in the States, has the entity in question ever been uh, subject to a request under that? Um, what, what is, is it practically going to apply to the data we are transferring? But that is quite different to 
what the ICO is talking about in terms of doing an assessment of the actual risk to the data subjects. It's kind of two quite different ways of looking at the same thing. So while the reference in the EDPB's updated guidance to practical application is helpful, which wasn't in the first draft, it is quite different and it certainly doesn't go as far as um, the flexibility provided by doing a, an assessment of the, the actual risks based on the individuals involved, the data that you're transferring, and the likelihood of, of say, the NSA being interested in that data. And we are seeing that come through now with um, some decisions from the EU supervisory authorities. We've spoken before about the, for example, the Austrian DPA um, saying that, uh, issuing a decision saying that Google Analytics couldn't be used because there's a transfer to the states and 50702 applies, regardless of the fact that we're, you know, you're only talking about um, browser information on, on visiting websites and, and query how much of risk there is there and the fact that Google say they've never had a request for that data, the Austrian DPA said, well, that doesn't matter. Um, it's not, not a lawful transfer. In terms of the ICO's approach, uh, you know, again, just reflecting on, on the key points, it's very much, as Grant and Rachel have explained, looking at whether there is indeed a restricted transfer and we have a bit more flexibility in that, and then looking in, in this issue around actually understanding who bears the compliance burden and coming back to who's actually instructed that transfer. Again, a difference from, from what we're seeing with the, the EU approach. So if it's a controller initiated or instructed transfer, then the controller needs to, to deal with, with uh, international transfer issues. If it is a processor that's initiating that transfer, then it sits with the, the processor. As Rachel's talked about, um, you know, the, the, this risk-based approach in what we now have is a proportionate approach to that. So looking at the risk of harm you identify, the size of the organization, so you're an SME or a large business, and, and the level of um, investigation you expect to do will vary depending on your size, and also the volume of data being transferred. But that can still be quite a, an onerous exercise, um, particularly if you are in the level three high category in terms of the amount of investigation you need to do, or, or if you're a large business as well. So understanding where you sit in that spectrum is is, is quite important. But I, I think the good news is that there is a lot more flexibility and certainly for more straightforward, lower risk transfers, the extent which you need to carry out investigations is is reduced. And, and as, as Rachel, I think, touched on you, there's some really interesting practical questions that the ICO raises here, such as, well, take something like FISA 702, it's all about uh, the NSA in the US getting information on foreign nationals. What is the likelihood of the data subjects transferring to that destination territory in a way that that their rights may be, may be breached by that data being accessed? It's not necessarily just about transfer there. You know, you could have issues of um, extradition if um, someone has done something which uh, breaches laws in that destination territory, but I think quite an interesting, again, practical question to ask when you assess risk, will those individuals ever be there? Are they ever likely to be of an interest to that law enforcement in that destination territory? The other interesting thing, I think, is this concept around partial transfers. So where you identify you do have high risk data, then rather than do that full assessment, you can actually say, well, we're only going to transfer the lower risk data and any transfer of high risk data will be by exception only. So again, gives gives organizations, I think, a lot more flexibility in, the, in their approach. Um, so th this, th I think this is um, my last slide, but just some thinking about how this then pans out around the responsibility for who does these TRAs. So if you are a processor, then if, you're, if you potentially have a lot more flexibility around how you manage your supply chain, less control, um, or, or interference from your um, customer base. But the flip side of that is that you are responsible for that TRA, you're responsible for ensuring that that transfer is lawful. And that's quite a change from the previous position where that burden was put on the controller to decide. So yes, flexibility, but with that comes greater responsibility. Um, if you're doing your TRA um, and you're doing that transfer, then you're, you're you're then taking responsibility for that. So good good things and and and, and bad things there. But you also still need to comply with your Article Twenty Eight obligations around use of subprocessors. So that means um, giving your um, the controller the right to object. So it doesn't give you total free range, just a bit more flexibility. Um, and your controller may still object to a transfer of it to say to a new a new territory if they are concerned. 
if you serve customers in the in the EU and you're subject to EU GDPR, then that flexibility may, may be a bit more limited. If you're a controller, um, then are you comfortable with the process of having like greater control over over international transfers? Yeah, less compliant. Yes, compliance sits with with the processor, but are you comfortable with that? And then looking at the flip side of that, you know, in Red Article Twenty Eight, how are you ensuring you discharge your obligations? How are you ensuring you've got sufficient guarantees um, from that uh, processor around how your data is handled? So, what additional diligence might you want to do if you are um, providing greater greater flexibility to to the processor? As I say, you still have the the ability to object to sub processors and and the processes that we'll, we'll all be familiar with, think again about how that applies to international transfers and how much diligence do you do on that processor's TRA? So they provide you with a TRA, they say they've done the work. What questions do you now need to ask on that? How much do you do you um, prod the tires on, on the work that they've done? The other thing you need to think about is privacy notices. So um, your know, international transfers are something that need to be covered in your privacy notice. The responsibility for privacy notice sits with the controller. How do you ensure oversight of what's going on and knowledge and how do you make sure that your privacy notice remains up to date when you don't have direct control over those transfers? And all of this, I think, then raises questions for all of us in, in terms of what we're drafting into contracts um, and what, what we're doing to actually manage risk around this. So leaving aside what the law says around who does the who's responsible for doing the TRA, who's responsible for doing the transfer is lawful. How does all of this pan uh, sort of pan out in terms of contract drafting, and what are the the norms that we are going to see um, going forward there? So lots lots of questions to to think about um, over the over the coming months um, as we all get used to this. Just to finish up before we go to the, the Q and A, so um, picking up on Grant's timeline from earlier, if we now look further ahead um, as to where we are around contract mediation and the introduction of all the new um, standard contractual clauses in IDTA. We now have the, the ICO's guidance. Um, for those of you who have transfers that are subject to uh, EU GDPR, then 27th of December is the key date for replacing all of those contracts um, with uh, the new um, EU SECs. Um, that needs to be done by 27th of December, so not much time if you have contracts that still need to be remediated. If, on the other hand, you are doing transfers that are subject to UK GDPR, then you have a lot longer. Um, for any contracts that were entered into prior to the 21st of September this year, you have until March of 2024 to replace those with either the IDTA um, or the UK addendum. So lots and lots there to, um, to think about and to cover. Um, I think we now move on to uh, the Q&A. So let me just see uh, what questions we've had um, come in. So Grant, I think that there's a question uh, for you, which I uh, someone I think was just asking around, sorry, I've lost the question that came up, but uh, just on this point around um, transfers and um, the transfers to a non-UK controller. And just to, yeah. to, to recap on that, um, sorry, I, the, the question was on screen two minutes ago. It seems to disappear. So, I, think. I, I think it's to yeah. do with reverse, what I call That's the, right, yeah. transfers. Yeah. Uh, and the, the question I think I've got it in front of me. So if a controller outside the UK sends something to a processor in the UK who then sends that information back to that controller, that is not a restricted transfer regardless of whether the UK GDPR applies to the controller. That is my understanding of the ICO's position is that if a controller initiates a transfer to a processor, which involves the processor then returning the data to that controller, then the ICO's view is that is just akin to a transfer within the controller. So same legal entity because the, the transfer was initiated by the controller and it basically loops its way back to the controller. And the ICO's view is that is not a restricted transfer. Um, whether or not the controller is uh, subject to UK GDPR or not. Yes, uh, that is my understanding. Yeah. If Martin said that's not necessarily our understanding of the ED EDPB's views. Um, so they're, they are different, particularly where the controller is non, not regulated by EU GDPR. Um, we think the EDPB is saying something different in it because it's not applying this who's initiating or agreeing the transfer test. 
and who's responsible for it. And the, the ICO's view is because it's the controller that's initiating agreeing that transfer, it's responsible. But actually, since the data is just going to its process and back to it, there isn't a restricted transfer. Great, thank you. Um, Rachel, um, it sounds like we're all going to have to become experts on, on human rights law. Um, so that's another, another thing to, to add to our, um, our, our list. Can, can you give any examples of, sort of high risk transfers that we think could risk, increase the risk of a human rights breach? Yes, yeah, so there's probably some examples that we could give on, for example, what would be a, a high risk as opposed to a low risk. So, for example, um, a high risk transfer that could risk um, breach of individuals' human rights could be, for example, if you are an employer um, in the UK and you collect various different types of information on your employees. So, for example, um, sexual orientation and that information is then sent to a parent company in a third country where same sex relationships are illegal. Um, and if in that case you could reasonably infer or imply that those data subjects could at, that, at some point tra travel to that to that country, um, the, the tool does ask whether their human rights could be at risk in that scenario. Um, that's obviously quite an extreme example. Um, and you know that would be a lot different to a scenario where you perhaps had a processor in a third country who was going to send out text messages on your behalf to your you know, consumer database where you're um, you were telling them exactly um, what kind of information you wanted to be in the text messages. You weren't giving names and addresses. You only just gave the, the, the phone number and they were to delete it afterwards. Um, that type of transfer is, you know, obviously a very different risk profile to, to the first one. Great. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, we had a question asking whether we could produce a schematic to try and make this all, all um, a bit more straightforward to follow. Um, so I, I think that is certainly something we're looking at doing and we will be um, publishing a, um, a blog post or um, an update um, summarising all of this uh, hopefully um, early next week. So uh, we will share that in, uh, in the link when we follow up with the recording for today's session. Um, but also, yeah, we will look at doing a sort of flow chart that might help. Um, just one other question here is just asking around um, whether transfers between a, an EU controller and a UK processor impacted by this. And the answer to that is that because there's an adequacy decision between or by, from the European Commission in respect of the UK that transfers from the EU to the UK or indeed to any of the other countries where there's an adequacy decision are not affected by all of this. So those transfers can take place um, without the need to put in place any additional um, transfer tools such as standard contractual clauses or, or the need to carry out um, the transfer risk assessment there. So if, if there's an adequacy decision, you can rely upon that without needing to, to, to go through this process. Um, Grant, I think this one might be one for you. So I, I think as we've sort of seen today, you know, the, the approach that we got from the ICO, particularly under option one, is, is quite holistic in terms of um, you know, looking at overall human rights rather than sort of a technical analysis of, of the law in, in the destination country and, and also the, the blog post title um, from the ISO talks about empowering innovation and growth. That's kind of what it leads on rather than protecting personal data. It just uh, I guess a sort of question asking for some thoughts in terms of how we see this sort of playing out around the approach that the ICO is taking to all of this um, and how that diverges from the, the EU and whether that will potentially you know, follow through in terms of guidance in other areas? Are, are we seeing the ICO perhaps be a little bit freer now? It's not subject to the um, consistency mechanisms under GDPR? I think it would, it, what struck me when I looked at the blog post was that was the title, you know, International Transfers Empowering Innovation and Growth Whilst Protecting per People's Personal Information. I mean, it clearly uh, a different, much greater difference in emphasis as to what actually the ICO is trying to do, uh, and you know, and that's that the echoes there of the post-Brexit view of, of Britain, and and actually what we're trying to do in terms of our place in the international stage. Uh, I could never see the EDPB uh, publishing guidance with that kind of title. The EDPB view this, I think, very much much more from it is a privacy it's a privacy issue and the economics, the wider economics of this, are not really their concern. So I think there is a, 
I think there is definitely a difference in ethos and approach. Uh, and I'm, certainly ICO must be conscious of the mood music that's coming out from government and, you know, the proposals for debt protection reform and the way that the wind's blowing and all of that. So the interesting question for me, um, I don't know exactly how much consultation or how much discussion the ICO has had with the, you know, its European counterparts, even though it's not formally in any mechanism anymore or inconsistency, because clearly we have an adequacy decision that's that's uh, in place, but it, you know, is subject to review. You know, at the time the adequacy decision came out, you know, it very much the the um, European Commission and uh, said that you know they were keeping an eye on what the UK was doing. So I've no doubt that the EU are not just sitting by and not looking at this. So it'll be interesting to see what um, the EDPB make of it. But what I would say is that the UK government has been um, and, it's, uh, and it has moved around quite a lot in terms of what it's doing in terms of debt protection reform. But certainly the most recent uh, pronouncements that have come out uh, from government have suggested that whatever it's doing, it is very much mindful that it doesn't want to lose or jeopardise the adequacy decision that it has from the EU. So I would be surprised if there had been no discussion at all uh, as to the approach that the UK was taking. But um, we'll have to wait and see. Great, thank you. Um, so that I think is us at time. That's it just coming to quarter to the hour. Um, so thank you very much for um, joining us. I'm sorry we didn't get to, to all the questions. We did have quite a lot coming through today. Um, but if, if you do want to follow up with us, simply just drop us an email and we can we can do that. Um, so I hope you find today useful. Um, there's a lot, I think, to, to think about and, and reflect on this. And we will be, as a publishing more more thoughts and, and views over the coming weeks as we as we work through it and, and we all grapple with with the new rules on on that note i think all that means to be said is just thank you very much for joining and uh, we hope to see you again soon thanks thank you thank you